Hello and welcome to this Foster Care Institute online training webinar, Helping Children with Anxieties and Disorders. I'm Dr. John DeGarmo, the founder and director of the Foster Care Institute, and I am a foster and adoptive parent myself. Our goal in this webinar is to increase the awareness of the many, many anxieties and disorders that children in foster care may very well face. You will gain knowledge and strategies designed to best help children and your families who face these very challenges. As a foster and adoptive parent myself, I have seen many children come through my home. 50 plus children come through my home, many of them with anxieties and disorders, and in truth, I have adopted some children with some of these disorders that we will be examining in this webinar. So this is something that is very, very uh, acute, something very, very personal to me. Now, of course, when a child arrives in our home, when a child is placed into our home as a foster, when we are a foster family and foster parents, and a child is placed into our home as a foster child, it is a time of anxiety. The anxiety begins there. I want you to put aside all the abuse, all of the neglect, all of the hurt and pain the child may have suffered before being placed into our home and think about the anxiety of being placed into your home. It is a time of questions. It may be a time of excitement for you, but for the child, it is a time of questions. It is a time of concern. It is a very, very scary time. Indeed, we have examined this in detail and full in, uh, in other webinars here at the Foster Care Institute. But I want you to know this. The anxiety is very real for a child when she is placed into your home just because you put, provide a home that is stable, a home that is secure, a home that is safe. You may have wonderful opportunities and very nutritious menus. You may have fantastic home. It is still a very scary time for that child. It is known as placement disruption. The child has had everything that she knows taken away from her. She's been completely disrupted and she is placed into your home. There are, to be sure, a mixture of emotions and feelings for that child. She is afraid. She is confused. He might be full of anger. To be sure, we've had a few children arrive into our home who look just like that little boy right there. They are angry. They are angry at being removed from their family. They are angry at coming to live in our home. They are angry at the caseworker. They may be angry at a police officer. They are angry at the foster care system. They may be angry at their birth parents or their relatives. They just may be so full of anger. Then there are those children who are filled with guilt. The 13-year-old boy who came to our home to live with our home, he was a the oldest of a sibling group of five. He was in charge of the family finances for his home. He was in charge of his brothers and sisters. He was the parental, the adult figure at 13 years of age, while his mother, while their mother, all five of the children, their mother was strung out on drugs and selling meth and working in prostitution. This child felt very, very guilty because his family was being placed into a foster care home. He felt, at 13 years of age, that it was his fault. And for, to be sure, he was filled with anxiety. Then there are those children who are very, very doubtful. They have tremendous doubt about themselves. They're filled with self-doubt. You can see. You can see that this is a time of mixture of emotions and feelings. These children normally are feeling nothing but being afraid. There is no happiness in them. There is no joy in them for being placed into your home as a foster child. There may be a sense of relief, but in, in the end, most children want to go back to their mother and father. Why is that? Because it is their norm. Placement disruption is a very, very traumatic experience for a child. It is a time of emotional upheaval. When they arrive in your home, 
Remember this. It is to them a new home. New rules. Perhaps they came from an environment where there were no rules, where there was no structure, where there was no consistency in anything whatsoever. And of course, there are those new parents, they're told, they're foster parents. It took me a while, personally, it took me a few placements to realize that I was I could I could provide all of that wonderful opportunities for the child. My home was warm, loving, inviting, safe, secure, stable, consistent, all those great things, all those wonderful attributes. But at the end of the day, the child did not want to be in my home because I was not their daddy. My wife was not their mommy. They wanted to go back to that abusive environment, that neglectful environment, that hurtful environment, that environment filled with pain, because that was their norm. That was their mommy and their daddy, and they wanted to be with their mommy and daddy. And of course, of course, it's part of the placement disruption. We often hear of separation anxiety, and we will examine that further in this webinar. And of course, when a child is placed into your home in foster care, there's the likelihood that the child may go to a brand new school as well. School is a, a new school is a reminder to a child in foster care that they are just that. They are a foster child. The label upon them is felt so heavy. And again, we've examined that in other webinars as well. Many times a child is removed from their home without any notification whatsoever. A caseworker and perhaps even a law enforcer may arrive, sweep in in the middle of the night and remove the child from their home. The child is confused. The child is unprepared. There are quick goodbyes to their mother and to their father, maybe a quick kiss or a hug. Without any explanation whatsoever, the possessions of the child are swept up into a black plastic bag. We've seen that image so many times in children in foster care. And in moments, they arrive into a home of strangers. Let there be no mistake. The child has a feeling of complete lack of control. There is no control for the child in this situation. They did not ask. First of all, they did not ask to live in an abusive environment. They did not ask to be removed from the only place they've known, from the only parental figures they've known. They've not asked for that. They did not ask to move to your home. They did not ask to live with you. They did not ask to go to a new school. They did not ask to be placed into the foster care system. This is a time of anxiety. Placement disruptions often have emotional, psychological, and social effects. Many times, when a child is removed from one home to another home to another home, which is known as multiple displacements, the mental health of that child is indeed threatened. We've seen in other seminar, or webinars here that the academic performances for children in foster care are traditionally lower than those of traditional students. Again, as a child goes from one school to another school to another school, they fall further and further behind. Now, you and I both know this. It is very important. In fact, it is essential that children form a healthy relationship with an adult, hopefully a parent. It is necessary for young children to form a relationship with one main parental figure, perhaps yourself, perhaps their mother and their father, maybe their grandparents, their caretaker, in order to develop socially and emotionally. If you are a foster parent, if you are a caseworker, you have most likely have seen uh, the results of a child who did not have the opportunity to form that healthy relationship with one main parental figure. And the results are generally and typically sad and tragic. While the removal of the home from a, from a child from her home and placed into another home, into a foster home, makes forming that main relationship with a parental figure or caretaker, it makes it quite difficult. And indeed, it makes it rather traumatic. 
Many times children have a difficult time forming a healthy relationship with an adult figure if they are being removed from their home suddenly without explanation into your home as a foster parent. There is a lack of trust. And then when they go from one home to another home to another home, oh my goodness, the results can be devastating for that child. Now, indeed, we have often heard of separation anxiety. If you work in the foster care system or you're a foster parent yourself, the more a child is moved from one home to another home and from one school to another school, the more the anxiety will increase for that child. The separation from the child's parents, their mom, their dad, their aunts, their uncles, their cousins, their grandparents, perhaps even sometimes their own siblings, as well as the separation from their friends, their friends at school or at church or in the neighborhood, it creates a sense of anxiety. Children that undergo multiple displacements, which again is the removal of one home to another home, of going to multiple foster homes or different placements, children who undergo that, often make it difficult for a child to form any type of relationship whatsoever. And there should be no surprise. should be no surprise in this whatsoever. Can you imagine a child, imagine yourself as a child going from one home to another home to another home over the course of months or even years and having no permanent family. How is it possible to form a healthy, long-lasting relationship and bond with an adult when you don't know how long you're going to be there with them? That's what's happened to these children. So many children place walls, emotional walls or barriers to separate themselves from this pain that they are feeling, this pain of separation, this pain of loss, this pain of anxiety, this pain of confusion. So how do we treat separation anxiety? Well, we should be looking for opportunities at all times to create and to form a bond with that child whether it's sitting down and reading a book to the child, whether it's helping the child with homework, whether it's inviting the child to cook with you or maybe to make cookies, whether it's going on a walk or flying a kite or just having some snuggle time, whatever it may be, look for an opportunity to create and form a bond with that child. If possible, actually, let's, let's neglect that. At all times, it should be possible to show compassion in all areas. Now, there may be times, and we've seen this in other webinars, there may be times when you are just exhausted or worn out or frustrated. Do not let this show to the child. This child needs you to be compassionate when they're undergoing separation anxiety. Listen to the child's concerns. Let them speak openly to you. Allow them to express what they're feeling and show in your actions and your words that you trust the child, that you have placed trust in the child. And if needed, seek professional therapy. Now, as a foster parent, I want you to understand this. It is okay, it is okay for you to seek professional therapy, professional counselors, trained therapists, trained professionals, it is okay. See, you may be an expert in one area. You may be an expert in many areas, but most likely you may not be an expert in professional therapy. You may not have been trained in that, and that's all right. It does not mean that you are a failure as a foster parent or you are a failure as a parent. It does not mean that you're letting the child down. It does not mean that you're not a good parent. It simply means this. There are those people out there in our world who have been trained professionally for years to help children in counseling and therapy. Just like you go see or take a child to a doctor and the child is sick or to a dentist. If you have a flat tire, you take a car to a professional to get the car fixed. Or, or a, 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 uh, the car is, you know, the, the, the engine is not working. Or maybe you are having, um, you know, some type of issues. You go see a professional. Well, that's what you do with children. It's okay to seek out a professional therapist if needed for that child. Something we also often hear about is post-traumatic stress disorder, often known as PTSD. 
PTSD is a psychiatric disorder that occurs when somebody has witnessed a traumatic event. Perhaps it is the death of a loved one. Maybe it is a natural disaster. Perhaps it is a severe accident. It may even be forms of abuse, physical, mental, emotional abuse, sexual abuse. Does the last one sound like children in foster care to you? It sure does to me. In fact, any of those could be. Those who suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder often have reoccurring dreams. They often have reoccurring thoughts. They think about this often. They have reoccurring feelings of these events. Indeed, they relive the event over and over and over again in flashbacks or in nightmares. And those flashbacks could be triggered any time of day, any time of night. They may have feelings of anger. They may be experiencing depression. They may sink into sadness. They may be afraid. Indeed, they may withdraw or be detached from you, from their teachers, from their caseworkers, from their therapists, from even their birth parents. They may be withdrawn or detached from everybody. Those who suffer from PTSD may also experience overly aggressive behavior. They may sink into a world of drugs and alcohol abuse to escape from their pain, they believe. They may dabble or engage in sexual behavior. Perhaps they are committing self-harming behavior upon themselves. They may be cutting themselves or abusing themselves physically or trying to commit suicide. Now, I must tell you this. If this is happening to a child in your home, a child has been placed into your home, if a child ever shows, ever shows any type of self-harming behavior towards himself, you must immediately contact your child supervisor and document it immediately. They may avoid similar situations or environments that may remind them of their experience. Post-traumatic stress disorder may appear in a person weeks or months or even years after a traumatic event may first occurred. It is often not diagnosed in a child until much later. Now one study found that one of every three children in foster care, one out of every three children in foster care between the ages of six to eight, suffer from PTSD. We often hear about post-traumatic stress disorder in our U.S. war veterans, and that is, uh, it is quite a problem. But did you know this? One study found that children in foster care suffer from PTSD at twice the rate, twice the rate of our U.S. war veterans. You may not have heard that. In fact, and indeed, it's likely you did not hear that. I would pretty much guarantee your friends and family members have not heard that because society and the media do not place a focus upon children in foster care, yet they are suffering. So how do we help youth and children with post-traumatic stress disorder. I love play therapy. I love this form of therapy. Play therapy allows a child to freely and naturally express themselves through the simple act of play. This is where trained therapists, they are able to monitor and observe a child and help treat this child through play. See, this play therapy allows a child to cope, to, to deal with all of the emotional trauma that they're experiencing, their anxieties that are placed upon their shoulders, all the stress that they feel. They're able to cope through that through play. Yes, the simple act of play can be incredibly therapeutic for a child who's experiencing post-traumatic stress disorder. EDMR or eye movement desensitization and reprocessing also allows those professionally trained therapists to use the child's rapid rhythmic eye movement instead of talk sessions to help the child deal with the events that have so traumatized them. 
Again, this is something where your trained professional therapist should be engaged in. Cognitive behavior therapy, also known as CBT, again allows a trained therapist to teach the child now, to teach that child to recognize their thought patterns and how to use problem solving skills, something we hear about so much in schools, how to use problem solving skills to better address and to better help themselves when they are suffering through these flashbacks through these nightmares when they're reliving those those horrible thoughts and memories how can you help a child through ptsd how can you do it in your own home well to begin with you can reassure reassure the child that they are safe and they are in a safe environment in your home you reassure them remind them consistently let them know that they are not in harm's way and that your home is a safe place for them. Remind them over and over and over again, consistently, that that traumatic experience, that abuse they, they once experienced, whatever it may have been, is now over, and that you will protect that child. You will keep that child safe. Do this daily through your actions and your, and your words. Again, allow that child the opportunity to share with you about what had happened and how he feels about it. He may not be, he may not feel, feel comfortable doing that right away. Indeed, he may not feel comfortable doing that for some time. But when the child begins to talk to you, when the child feels comfortable enough to open up and, and talk to you about the experience, don't be too busy to listen. Indeed, put everything aside and Focus all of your attention on that child because that child needs, needs to heal. And some of that healing comes through talking. And when the child is ready to talk, you need to be ready to listen. You can also help a child with PTSD by providing routine and consistency in the child's life. Regular, consistent uh, mealtime, playtime, bedtime, homework time chore time, uh, time for getting up in the morning, whatever it may be, to provide routine in your home. Be consistent in how you respond when the child misbehaves. When the child acts out, misbehaves, and makes poor choices in your home, be consistent in how you respond to that. Allow her the opportunity to play therapy in your own home with simple things by coloring, by drawing, by playing, and by using that wonderful gift of imagination. Allow your child to play and if necessary, look what I put there and I, I capitalize it all words, teach. Teach your child how to play. I have had many children come through my own home who did not know how to play. Get down on the ground with them and play cars, build uh, Lego buildings, uh, go outside and play basketball, throw the football around. Whatever it may be, teach that child to play if necessary. Disinhibited Social Engagement Disorder, also known as DC, DSED, is an attachment disorder where a child actively approaches unfamiliar people, strangers if you will, in an attempt to engage or interact with them. It may develop due to a lack of nurturing or affection from the caregiving adult or the care, caring adult or the caregiver or the parental figure in their lifetime during those early formative years. This is when the child, this is when a child who has DSED is a child who will run up to a stranger, any stranger, and look for a hug or look for a kiss or run off to a stranger and talk to them. That's what that looks like. And I have one in my own home. Children with DSED, Disinhibited Social Engagement Disorder, is a child who will seek out affection and loving relationships or form a bond with other people outside of your home. The child is indeed very comfortable, extremely comfortable with complete strangers as they are with you or any other primary caregivers. These children are very talkative, and these children are very, very social with strangers. Indeed, these children have no fear whatsoever 
of giving a stranger a hug or giving a stranger a kiss. And you can imagine this can lead to a tremendous life of problems later on. How do you treat DSED? Well, to begin with, professional therapy with a trained therapist is often the best way to go. And as we, as we uh, implied earlier, do not feel bad or that you are a failure. Trained therapists are just that. They are trained professionally to address and to help children with these types of disorders. Another form of treatment that you can do in your own home, again, is that play therapy. Art therapy is another wonderful program. Art therapy allows a child, like play therapy, to express herself through coloring, through painting, through sculpture, or other forms of art. When the child is sitting at your table and is coloring a piece of, pic uh, uh, a piece of paper and drawing and making drawings, that's a form of healing for the child. The child's able to express themselves in a nonverbal fashion. Indeed, this can be fascinating. If you ever look at a picture drawn by a child of foster care place in your home, at the beginning of their placement, they may draw pictures of sad-looking people, maybe stick figures with frowns on the children. Hopefully, as they continue to live in your home and you provide a loving, consistent, structured um, environment in their home, hopefully those frowns will turn into smiles. But it is a fascinating thing to watch. Now, perhaps you've heard of this, reactive attachment disorder. Reactive attachment disorder, like DSED, is an attachment disorder where children are unable to form a healthy relationship and indeed an emotional attachment with a parent or with a caregiver, with a foster parent, with a caseworker. Now, this may result from abuse or neglect early in the child's lifetime. Take a look at that picture on the left, I'm sorry, on the right hand side there. Have you seen that child in your own home? I have, and perhaps you have as well. That may be the look of reactive attachment disorder. Reactive attachment disorder is a lack of affection from the child. The child shows you no affection whatsoever or any adult figure, no affection whatsoever. There is a lack of response when you may show affection towards a child. They simply do not respond. A child who has reactive attachment disorder may have difficulty looking another person in the eye. They may have a difficult time interacting with others, their own age or older. Children who suffer from reactive attachment disorder often become angered or frustrated and they feel they have, uh, and they're very, very difficult to calm down because they feel they have no control. They have a feeling of lack of control and that angers them and frustrates them. And again, it is difficult to calm them down. They often appear withdrawn, sad, and melancholy, and they are often distrustful of others. Now, how do you treat reactive attachment disorder? Well, as you can imagine, professional therapy sessions and professional trained therapists are essential for this type of disorder. You can help in your own home by providing a consistent, caring, and nurturing environment and be very, very patient with these children who have reactive attachment disorder. Provide stimulating environments with plenty of options and opportunities for the child to learn new things and to be nurtured at the same time. Now, like other disorders, you need to be reasonable and realistic with your expectations. You need to be realistic with your expectations from that child. Don't expect therapy and treatment to quickly resolve all of those issues and to be a quick fix. Don't think that just loving that child with all that you have and providing a loving environment for that child is going to be the resolution either. There is no real quick fix for reactive attachment disorder. Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, otherwise known as ADHD. Now, according to some studies, children in foster care are three times more likely 
to be diagnosed with ADHD than others their age. ADHD is a medical condition where brain activity and brain development are indeed affected. Now generally, Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, ADHD, is a genetic disorder. It may also occur though from alcohol or tobacco consumption by the mother during her time of pregnancy. ADHD may also occur from high levels of lead or pesticides exposure and it may also occur from significant brain injury as well. Now those who suffer from ADHD have difficulty concentrating and fo focusing on the task, the task at hand in front of them. They struggle with listening and indeed they are often uh, they are often confused with daydreaming. People often uh, confuse them with daydreaming and instead they're simply struggling with ADHD. A child appears forgetful. A child appears inattentive or even absent-minded. Those children who are are known as being the absent-minded child, they may be suffering from ADHD. These children often rush through the task quickly trying to get something done. And then they seem restless. They may seem hyperactive. They may appear to become bored easily. Indeed, they may become bored easily. And they often struggle to keep quiet or to even simply sit still. And as you can imagine, for all of these things you see in this page here, this can be a tremendous challenge for a child who has ADHD while in the classroom and in the learning environment. Sadly, there is no known cure for ADHD. It can be treated, though, with medication designed to treat ADHD, but you must, you must, you must consult your doctor. There are forms of behavior therapy that helps to reduce behavior issues that affect a child. This type of therapy also strengthens and reinforces positive behavior that this child can learn when they're struggling with issues of ADHD. Of course, there's psychotherapy and family therapy sessions may also be helpful as well. Consult your doctor, consult your trained professional therapist, and even consult your caseworker if you think you should attend a family therapy session for your child. Now, ch children who suffer from attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, they also are known to act rashly or impass impulsively. They often have emotional reactions, which may seem overly dramatic or intense to the situation, and they may interrupt others, finding it difficult to wait their turn. So again, treat these with the type of medications conducted by, suggested by your doctor or your therapist. Treat these with professional therapists and family therapy sessions. Finally, we come to fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, known as FASD, which is sadly a huge issue in foster care. In fact, several studies, as we talk, you and I right now, several studies are suggesting that it is much wider it occurs wider in foster care than once thought. We shall address this in a separate seminar. Make no mistake, the child who arrives in your home, the child who is placed into your home as a child from foster care, will be most likely suffering from anxieties, most likely be, likely be suffering from one of these disorders. It is a challenging time for you as a foster parent, but it is indeed a very, very challenging time for the child. Let us remember this. At first, a child is scared, confused, anxious, afraid, guilt-ridden, angered, does not want to be in your home. We must give this child our full attention, our full compassion, patience, love, structure, routine, and time. And we also need to seek out, when necessary, trained professional therapists to help these children who are suffering from these anxieties and these disorders. For more information about this issue or other issues, go to my website, the Foster Care Institute. Follow me on Twitter and Facebook for 
daily updates and resources and videos and statistics and tips about all things foster care. And of course, you may email me at drjohndegarmo at gmail.com for questions about this webinar or other questions you may have. Now, we examine this entire topic in a chapter in the book, The Foster Care Survival Guide, The Essential Guide for Today's Foster Parents. And in truth, there are other books and resources available for you as well. My friend, when a child comes into your home as a child in foster care, it is it can be in a time of excitement. It can also be a time of anxiety. It can be a challenging time. It can be a frustrating time. And when the children come into your home and they have these disorders, please do not think it is your fault. Please do not think that you can quickly address these issues and treat these issues. It is not your fault, and it may take time. It may take time from you. It may take time from professional therapists as well. I want to thank you for watching this webinar, and I want to thank you for caring for children in need. For the Foster Care Institute, I'm Dr. John DeGarmo.